Hello and most welcome to 1199 of the Heidegger series. And I will start today with a little reading from the book Louder Than Words. The New Science of How the Mind Makes Meaning by Benjamin K. Bergen. And we can read a recite, a review here from the Master himself. A stunningly beautiful synthesis of the new science of meaning, vivid and frolling and remarkably even funny, George Lakoff. This was criti criti critically widely acclaimed as one of the best books of the years in the area. <laughs> I'd say it's truly fantastic value for money In the introductory chapter, so we have the polar bear's nose. Polar bears have a taste for seal meat, and they like it fresh. So if you're a polar bear, you're going to have to figure out how to catch a seal. <laughs> when hunting on land, the polar bear will often stalk its prey almost like a cat would, scoting along its belly to get right up close, and then pounce, claws first, jaws agape. The polar bear mostly blends in with its icy, snowy surroundings, so it's already at an advantage over the sea, which has relatively poor sense of vision. But seals are quick. Sailors who encounter polar bears in the 19th century reported seeing polar bears do something quite clever to increase their chances of a hot meal. According to these early reports, as the bear sneaks up on its prey, it sometimes covers its muscle with its paw, which allows it to go more or less undetected. Apparently, polar bear hides its nose. When I first read about this ingenious behavior, I found it fascinating. Does the bear have the mental flexibility to envision what it looks like to others? and the creativity to figure out how to conceal itself? Or is this nose covering just a trick that evolution has dropped into the polar bear's quiver of built-in behaviors? A freak behavior that happened to confer a survival advantage and was therefore selected for over the course of millennia. Now, although there is doubtless a lot more to say about this charismatic megafauna, this is not a book about polar bears. It's a book about you, and more specifically, how you understand language. So consider, if you will, what you did when you opened this book and started reading the first paragraph. 
You cast your eyes over the letters that made up the words. You recognize familiar words like bear and seal and hunting and snow. That all seems pretty straightforward. It's the kind of thing a well-written piece of software or well-trained parrot could do. But then you're starting to do things that were a little deeper. Once you know what the words were, you began to find meaning in them. You know what type of animals and objects the nouns refer to, and the type of actions and events the verbs described. But you didn't stop at words. You made sense of the sentences they made up. Sentences that I am almost certain you never encountered before. And the things the sentences described probably, be, probably came to life. The bear scooting along its belly through the snow and the ingenious but awkward way it would have to hold its paw over its nose. Maybe you even went so far as to virtually see the Arctic scene in your mind's eyes. And then, here's the really remarkable part. You went beyond that. You filled in details that were never explicitly mentioned. How do I know? You see, polar bears as surely surmised hide their dark muzzles because the thick fur that covers their body, including their paws, but not including their noses, is white. And they live surrounded by snow and ice, which for the most part is also white. But here's the thing. I n actually never mention anything about color. If you look back at the first paragraph of this chapter, you'll see that the whiteness of the snow and of the beer and the blackness of its nose are completely implied. You colored in the picture. And it's a good thing you did because without color, the story makes absolutely no sense at all. There is no other obvious reason for a polar bear to cover its nose. How do you manage to do all this? How do you take scribbles on a page, or for that matter that pops, buzzes, and hums of human speech and make them something to you. How do you know what the words and sentences mean? And how do you fill in the gaps? How do you how do you do what you're doing right now? That's the mystery of meaning and that's in effect what this book is about. The meaning makers. Making meaning might be one of the most important things we do. For starters, it's something we're doing almost constantly. We swim in a sea of words. Every day we hear and read tens of thousands of them. And somehow, for the most part, we do understand them. We understand who they refer to and what situations they describe. We make inferences about the things 
that weren't even mentioned and prepared to respond appropriately constantly tirelessly automatically we make meaning what's perhaps most remarkable about it is that we hardly notice we're doing anything at all there are deep rapid complex operations afoot under the surface of the skull and yet all we experience is a seamless understanding meaning is not only constant it is also critical we use language to make sense of the world we use it almost any time we interact with other people to flirt command inform beg and form social bonds a few words can change our minds change our marital status or change our religion words affect who we are as a species language is our most powerful and pervasive tool with language we can communicate what we think and who we are without language we would be isolated we would have no fiction no history and no science to understand how meaning works then is to understand part of what it is to be human and not not just human but uniquely human no other animal can do what we can do with language of course parts of human human language have homologues in other animals people talk fast and sentences can be extremely complicated but zebra finches sing tunes that rival our speed and complexity humans can drone on and on but even a filibustering senator doesn't outlast humpback whales whose song whose songs can continue for hours and all of the human ability to combine words in new ways seems pretty unique it's seen on a more limited scale in bees who dance message to each other that combine information about the orientation quality and distance of food sources what's special about human language what marks it as distinct from other ever every other natural occurring form of communication in the known universe is that we can use it to convey pretty much any meaning that we want A bee can waggle its abdomen until it falls off, but it will never communicate anything beyond what it's programmed to. It can't say that the weather's likely to clear up, that it had a decent night's sleep, or that it's looking forward to the weekend because it has a hot date with a hydrangea. Human language, in contrast to all other communication systems, is open-ended. We can talk about things that exists. 
like inarticulate presidential candidates and rail fin models. Or even things that don't, like Martian anthropologists or vegetarian zombies. And for the most part, other people, at least people who speak our language and have normal functioning cognitive systems, are able to understand us. No other animal can do this. And because this level of meaning, making it unique to our species, determining how it works, brings us up one step closer to knowing what distinguishes us from other animals. There are other, more practical reasons to pursue the science of meaning. Imagine computer systems that truly understand you when you talk to them. or that can automatically translate from one human language to another. No reasonable Star Trek worthy future would be complete without them. Understanding how meaning works can also help us improve the way we teach foreign languages. And it can lead to restorative therapies and technologies for people who have suffered brain damage that impairs their ability to understand or produce language meaningfully. For all these reasons, language has held a privileged spot in science and philosophy throughout history. For centuries, philosophers have asked what it is that we humans have that our tongue-tied relatives don't. What cognitive capacities evolution has endowed us with that allows us to understand and appreciate sonnets and songs, exhortations and explanations, newspapers and novels, and there are half a dozen academic disciplines dedicated to different aspects of language. From English and foreign languages to communications, semantics, psycholinguistics, cognitive linguistics, and neurolinguistics. Thanks to research in these fields, we now know a lot about grammar of sentences, about how people articulate speech, and how to best teach a foreign language. But for the most part, we fail to answer the most important question of all. Language matters to us because it is a vehicle for meaning. It allows us to take the desires, intentions and experiences in our heads and transmit a signal through space that makes those thoughts pop up in someone else's head. We do not study French in order to perfectly form grammatical French sentences. We learn it to communicate. We do not read fiction because the words look appealing on the page, but because of the transporting flood of sights, sounds, 
places and ideas that good writing evokes. And yet, almost no one, from lay people to linguists, really knows how meaning works. That is until recently. This is the age of cognitive science. Had we, be, had we been born earlier, we might have been exploring new continents. Born later, we might be galvi, gallivanting through the stars. But right now, at this time in our history, the vast, tantalizing expanse that begs to be discovered is the human mind. And some cognitive scientists, like me, have started to turn their attention to meaning. Over the past decade, a few key experimental advances have quickly elevated meaning to hot topic status in cognitive science. Using fine measures of reaction time, eye gaze, and hand movement, as well as brain imaging and other state-of-the-art tools. We started to scrutinize humans in the act of communicating. We can now peer inside the mind and thereby put meaning in its rightful place at the center of the study of language and the mind. With these new tools, we manage to catch a glimpse of meaning in action, and the result is revolutionary. The way meaning works is much richer, more complex, and more personal than we ever would have predicted. This book tells the story of what we discovered so far. the traditional theory of meaning. For thousands of years, scientists and philosophers have been trying to figure out how meaning works, and yet good answers have been awfully hard to come by, much more so than for other aspects of language. The fields of linguistics and psychology have actually made substantial strides in the way that people pronounce and perceive words, and the reasons why words in sentences take the particular orders they do. These are aspects of language that are directly measurable. You can tell exactly when a speaker's tongue makes contact with a vellum to pronounce a hard K sound. But meaning is comparatively harder, because it's something that you do almost entirely in your mind. As a result, it is invisible to direct in inspection. We can't measure it, count it, or weigh it. That makes it hard to bring the usual means of science to bear on it. There's no debating the sizable potential rewards for learning, how meaning works. But for most of the human history, despite their allure, they eluded capture. So although you might expect otherwise, scientific study of meaning is still in its infancy. However, even in the absence of solid empirical evidence, theories about how meaning works have developed and thrived. Over the years, most linguists, philosophers, and cognitive psychologists have come to settle on, particular, on a particular story, which probably isn't so different from your intuitive sense of meaning. When you contemplate meaning in your daily life, it's likely because you're wondering, or perhaps arguing about, what a given word means. 
It might be a word in your own language. What does obdurate mean? How about necrophagia or epicaracy? Or it could be a word in another language. What does the formidable word, German word Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzung mean? In general, you're probably most aware of meaning when you're thinking about definitions. This is also the starting point for the traditional theory of meaning. Words have meaning, meanings that are likely definitions in your mind. What would it be like if meaning worked this way? When you think about it, a definition of meaning would need to have two distinct parts. The first is the definition itself. This is a description of what the word means. It's articulated in a particular, particular language like English, and is supposed to be a usable characterization of the meaning. But there is a second part too, which is implicit. The definition characterizes something in the world. So speed limit, or if you prefer, Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzung, actually refers to something that exists in real life independent of your knowledge about it, whether you know that there is a speed limit or what it is, you can still get pulled over for driving faster than the number of the sign. So both the mental definition and the actual meaning, actual thing in the world that the word refers to are each critical parts of the meaning of the word. Many philosophers have taken it as a given that these two parts are all you need to characterize meaning. And they've gone on to argue for centuries about which of the two parts is more important, the mental definition or the real world. But the important question for our purposes to understand how people understand is to ask how a definition of theory of meaning like this could explain the things we do with language. Do we really have these definitions in our minds? If so, where do they come from? How could we use them to plan a sequence of words? How could we use them to understand something that someone else has said? This is where things get a little more, little more complicated. As with any definition, your mental definitions would presumably need to be articulated in some language. But what language? Your first thought might be that it should be your native language. So English words have mental definitions in English and German words have mental definitions in German. Except when you follow that idea to its logical conclusions, 
there is a problem. If English words are defined in your mind in terms of other English words, then how do you understand the definitions themselves? You are not going in circles. <coughs> Here's an illustration of the problem from a real life situation that you might be able to relate to. Suppose you don't speak Japanese, but you're at a train station in Tokyo and there's a sign you want to look up the meaning of. So you pull out your dictionary and look up the characters. But at that point you realize, to your chagrin, that instead of a Japanese-English bilingual dictionary, you actually accidentally bought a Japanese, Japanese monolingual dictionary. Oops! <laughs> On the sign there is a squiggly character with a horizontal line and some dots. So you look up that in your dictionary, but regrettably the definition is nothing but a long string of many more characters that you also don't realize, recognize. You could try to look up this in turn, but you just get more of the same. The problem is the same one that you would have if your mental definitions were expressed in your native language. Definitions expressed in a particular language don't mean anything unless you understand the language already. So in understanding the word polar bear, say it wouldn't work to go through a process of activating an English definition of polar bear in your mind. This definition wouldn't be any more meaningful than the polar bear that you started out with. One solution to this problem is suppose that we have some other system in our mind. <clears throat> some way to encode ideas and thoughts and reasoning that doesn't use English or any real language. This mental language would need to have a lot of, of the stuff that the real language has. It would still have to be able to refer to things in the world as well as properties, relations, actions, events and so on. Anything that we can think about and understand language about. In other words, we might be thinking using something like a language of thought or mentalese. Simply stated, the language of thought hypothesis is that the meaning, meanings of words and sentences in any real language are articulated in people's minds in terms of this other mental language. Mentalese is supposed to be like a real language in that there are words that mean things and can combine with one another but Unlike a real language, it doesn't sound like anything or look like anything. So in Mentalese, we have a word that represents speed limits and another for epicaricacy and another for polar bears and so on. To understand a real language like English or Chinese, we need to translate the words we bear here or read into Mentalese. We need to translate the words we hear or read into Mentalese. So the language of thought hypothesis breaks mental definitions out of their self-referential circle by seeing the human capacity for meaning 
as aching to using a bilingual dictionary instead of a monolingual one. If you showed up at a Japanese train station with a Japanese English dictionary, you could understand what the Japanese character meant by looking up, looking them up in the dictionary, because the dictionary translates them into words a language you already know. And by analogy, the language of thought hypothesis states that for each word that we know, we have a mental entry that includes the definition articulated in mentalese. This is one of the most important and influential ideas people have had about meaning and the mind. But even if mentalese gets us out of the vicious circle of words defined in terms of other words, it still only gets us part way to meaning. This is, that's because it doesn't deal with the other half of a definitional theory of meaning. The things in the world that the mentalese words refer to According to the language of thought hypothesis, the words of mentalese are related to the world through a symbolic relationship. For instance, when you read the words polar bear and translate them into whatever your mentalese word for polar bear is, let's call it daksnuksnuksh. As a reminder, it's not to be pronounceable. That word has meaning by a dint on the, of the set of things in the world that are actually polar bears. So a sentence like the polar bear mostly blends in with its icy snowy surroundings, surroundings has meaning because it describes a situation in the world where a thing appropriately designated by your symbol for polar bear is in fact doing something designated by your symbol for blends into something designated by your symbols for icy, snowy surroundings. Over the centuries this has come to be the leading idea about how meaning works. Words are meaningful because you have mental definitions of them, articulated in mentalese, that match up to things in the real world. Embodied situation. But if you look a little closer, at the language of thought hypothesis, you'll find that there are actually some holes in it. The biggest one is that mentalese doesn't actually solve the problems inherent in a definitional theory of meaning. It simply pushes them back a level. The issue is aching to the earlier question of how an English definition of an English word could ever mean anything. Namely, how do we know what the words in mentalese mean? What language are they defined in? How does activating a sentence in mentalese actually create meaning? How does it allow us to understand? One way to think about this issue is to is using a version of thought experiment known as the Chinese room argument. This is coming from Putnam and Searle. 
say you are sitting in an enclosed room with two slots in it. Occasionally, someone will slide a card written in Chinese characters into the room through one of the slots. Now you don't know any Chinese, but your job is to look these characters up in a book. The book will have some other characters next to the one you looked up, and you're supposed to find a card with those other characters on them and slide it out of the room through the other slot. Because you don't know Chinese, you have no idea what's on the cards. But people outside the room who do know Chinese think that the person in the room must certainly be a native Chinese speaker because the responses that come out of the room are perfectly appropriate rejoinders to the message that they slip into the room. Of course, this is only possible if the book you're looking up the answer in is really well designed. But the question is, do you understand Chinese? I suspect you'll agree that no, of course you don't. We can apply the same reasoning to the language of thought hypothesis as an explanation of how meaning works. The Chinese characters in this example are like the words in Mentalese, simply identifying and arranging the symbols in some language, even if those symbols represent something in the real world, isn't enough to make meaning. It's not enough to say you understand something. This is one of the big problems with the language of thought hypothesis. And when you start to apply a little pressure, other cracks starts to appear. For when? For one. Where does mentalese come from? If it's something that's learned, then it certainly can't be learned from one's native language. Because that creates another vicious cycle. How could we learn mentalese based on English if we only understand English through mentalese. So if mentalese can't be learned from language, then that means that if there is such a thing as mentalese, it has to exist in our minds before we even start to learn language. In other words, in order to learn the English polar bear, we have to already have a mentalist symbol representing polar bears and this this also means that people who speak different languages must all have the same underlying concepts a polar bear is a polar bear is a polar bear there's good reason to question all of these claims even the greatest strength of the language of thought hypothesis, the simplicity of mentally symbols, is gained at a substantial cost. The idea that the weight of meaning might be carried by mentally symbols is quite powerful and appealing. 
because those symbols would be so simple. Symbols are pointers that just tell you what things in the world they refer to. To understand what the English word polar bear means is to have the symbol Naxnux <laughs> that refers to actual polar bears in the world. To understand the English word dog is to have some other symbol, maybe Chexnux 1 to 3. But the only means is to, uh, the only way to allow the symbols to be that simple is to leave out most of the details. The fact is that you probably know a lot about polar bears, their color, how they move, exactly how afraid of them you should be, what type of carbonated soft drink they purportedly prefer around the winter holidays, and so on. That's a lot to know, especially for something like polar bears, which you know comparatively little about. Think about something you know much more about, like dogs. You probably know what they look like and what they smell like, but also how they evolved from wolves and the fact that they can be recruited to pull sleds and that they take foully to being scratched about their tail. But a Mentalese word for polar bear or one for dog would be equival equivalently simple symbols that refer to the category of polar bears or dogs and skip over all this detailed and variable knowledge. A Mentalese symbol for dogs isn't a collection of memories you have of interacting with dogs or the breed of puppy you're hoping you'll get for your birthday. Instead, it's just a symbol that points to the range of things in the world that are in fact dogs. That's the thing. Symbols in Mantelese are first and foremost symbols. Meaning is simple, clean, logical and efficient. As a result, there is no place in this theory of meaning for details. A Mentalese symbol for dogs isn't the collection of memories you have of interacting with dogs or the breed of puppy you're hoping you'll get for your birthday. Instead it's just a symbol that points to the range of things in the world that are in fact dogs. That's the thing. Symbols in Mantelis are first and foremost symbols. Meaning is simple, plain, logical and efficient. As a result, there is no place in this theory of meaning for details. Clearly, thinking of meaning in terms of Mantelis symbols has some limitations. But until recently, it was the best game in town. 
our best guess was imperfect, but we didn't have to have the right empirical evidence to tell us what was really going on. That didn't stop at least some people over the years from realizing that the Emperor, if not entirely denuded, was revealing some indecent parts. <laughs> Starting as early as the 1970s, some cognitive psychologists, philosophers and linguists began to wonder where the meaning wasn't something to totally different from a language of thought. They suggested that instead of abstract symbols, meaning might really be something much more closely intertwined with our real experiences in the world, with the bodies we have. As a self-conscious movement started to take form, it took on a meme, embodiment, which started to stand for the idea that meaning might be something that isn't distilled away from our bodily experiences but is instead tightly bound by them. For you, the word dog might have a deep and rich meaning that involves the way ways you physically interact with dogs, how they look, smell and feel. But the meaning of polar bear will be totally different because you likely don't have those same experiences of direct interaction. If meaning is based on our experiences in our particular bodies in the particular situations we dragged them through, then meaning could be quite personal. This is an this in this in turn would make it variable across people and across cultures. As embodiment developed into a truly interdisciplinary enterprise, it found foothold by the end of the 20th century in linguists, especially in the work of the UC Berkeley linguist George Lakoff and in others in philosophy especially in the work by University of Oregon philosopher Mark Johnson, among others, and in cognitive psychology, where you, UC Berkeley psychologist Eleanor Roche's early work, work led the way. The embodiment idea was appealing but at the same time it was missing something, specifically a mechanism. Mentalese, for all its limitations, is a specific claim about the machinery people might use for meaning. Embodiment was more of an idea, a principle. It might have been right in the general sense, but it was hard to tell because it didn't necessarily translate into specific claims about exactly how meanings works in real people in real time. So it idled and it didn't supplant the language of thought hypothesis as the leading idea in the cognitive science of meaning. And then someone had an idea it's not clear who had it first, but in the mid-1990s, at least three groups converge upon the same thought. One was a cognitive psychologist, Larry Barsalou, and his student, students at Emory University in Georgia. The second was a group of neuroscientists in Parma, Italy, and the third was a group of cognitive scientists at the International Computer Science Institute 
in Berkeley where I happened to be working as a graduate student. There was clearly something in the water at Zeitgeist. The idea was the embodied simulation hypothesis, a proposal that would make the idea of embodiment concrete enough to compete with mental ease. Put it simply, maybe we understand language by simulating in our minds what it would be like to experience the things that the language describes. Sorry, we have to go back to this. I put a note here. This is describing the history, what's leading up to the enormous revolution in the early 2000s, and where we go from this absurdity of the idea of mental ease to something that is not as paradoxical. But it's amazing now, looking in hindsight, how we become accustomed to accepting mental ease as an explanation that there were significant words in our head that had no relevance to anything and still could represent something in the world. I was myself studying in the 90s and learned about intention and it was never ever explained what it was, how it worked or how it could work. And of course it could never ever work in any way. And I would say in the 90s the only one who was pointing to that was Jacques Derrida. Long live his memory because he was an enormous helper in those days where nothing of an help came from science of cognition, psychology, neurology or any other subject. It was all mental ease in those days. No other thing was thought of although those incredible paradoxes it led to. It's an amazing book, but it's an also an amazing history. I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. This is from Alisos, about 45 kilometers from Gothenburg. And we are at the old well house. People used to frequent the well to imbibe healthy salitrogenous water. The well is not far from here. I think it's situated on, well, Oops. why thank you very much.